The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talk Give me faith, trust what you say. On the talk station, Faith Matters. And welcome to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball. Thanks for joining us here today. I'm Pastor of Broad Creek United Methodist Church. I'm also joined by Reverend Robert Cornegie, Associate Pastor, Chapel by the Sea in Emerald Isle, and Reverend Carl Zorowski, Pastor of St. Peter's United Methodist Church in Moorhead City. And good day, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. All right, uh, as we get started here today, we're going to start with a, uh, a, a church and state issue. This is one that comes up, it's um, out of Charlotte. And and we've had the 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 case out of Rowan County about um, a prayer being said before their county commissioners meetings and and this one is about city council in Charlotte city council in Charlotte which has long had a prayer or an invocation at the beginning of its uh, of its meetings and then a couple of weeks ago a couple of Mondays ago uh, it was. Uh, was removed. Uh, Mayor Jennifer Roberts uh, said that at the uh, expert counsel of their of their attorney that um, that uh, they would not do the prayer. Uh, in the article that's in the Charlotte Observer, it says that um, from that one, it says on Monday, Roberts told the audience that they had been in a meeting with attorneys to discuss several recent court cases and separation of church and state before the meeting. Then instead of uh, starting with the typical prayer that rotates between council members, city council went straight into the Pledge of Allegiance. The um, the attorney says said no, that's not really what was ha- what was said. Uh, we didn't say you couldn't do it. And so uh, this week, when they met, city council met again. The mayor, uh, Mayor Jennifer Roberts, who has lost her bid for re-election, by the way, and in the Republican. Uh, Democrat primary yeah. um, uh, said uh, that's not what said, but the attorney did counsel them to perhaps not ask everybody to stand, not ask everyone to pray, just simply offer the invocation in one in any fashion that a the councilman wants to offer it, and then that would be and that would probably pass the test. Rowan County, in the meantime, has also just uh, yesterday voted to to go ahead and appeal their case. They lost their case and to appeal it to the Supreme Court. So mm-hmm. this could still be an issue up there. Okay, but it's a, uh, Robert, it's, a, it's a, a classic church-state issue that we've run across in separation of church and state before, right? Oh, this is the this is the gift that keeps on giving, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, when you're looking for some article to write something about, you know, this is this one usually pops up. Yeah, and uh, it's so wearying. You know, to see these politicians that, you know, they get so open minded that their brains fall out. (laughs) I mean, it's just incredible. And, uh, you know, to be able, you know, what's the whole purpose of an invocation? What do you do when you do an invocation? I'm asking two professional Christians here. Well, you you call on something um, greater than yourselves to 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 help guide you. That's right. You're you're looking for you're looking for guidance. You're looking for wisdom. You're looking for discernment. And I think that uh, in a room full of uh, politicians, that's probably very much needed. Yes. Oh, look! I mean, there should be in another room in the building a group of people praying through Just, that entire meeting well, sure. for those people because um, you know. The political system really does strip away, sadly, the the existence of God. I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing. It happens in Christianity as well. There's certain there there are, there are people that are called Christian atheists. Mm-hmm. They yeah, claim to right. be Christians, but they live their lives as though Christ does not exist. God does not exist. Mm-hmm. He's not a factor in any of their decision making and so when you look at our government and you wonder why why does government you know why is the congress what is their approval rating now oh you know about negative 10 <laughs> <laughs> and they actually begin each section session yes with prayer 
with an invocation. May only be two people in the room, but yes. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, yeah, I tell you, they say that politics and religion don't mix. And, and uh, you know, it is really sad that it doesn't anymore. It used to. You know, let me. I'm, I'm going to take the separation of church and state side for a second here, just in making the argument. Part of their argument is that, well, all right, we we have to not impose it. Uh, yes, all the people will have their faith and they have their right to their faith, but they can't impose it on others. And when you put it in a public meeting, uh, that that is that is saying this is uh, this is how we as a council believe, uh, and you should too. Well, you know, the thing is, isn't the one who's trying to stop the prayer, the invocation, imposing their particular perspective <laughs> yes. on those who have a different perspective mm-hmm. than them, that want prayer, that believe they need to um, go before God and humbly and ask for his assistance in this thing? Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, how do you parse that? How do you decide who who gets to win in and, that and when is it does it do they do that in in session do they do that before the session starts do they you know they're trying do to do they bring in outside you know that's what they do in Congress I mean they do have a chaplain but often he's not available so they bring in other mm-hmm. other local pastors to do it so go well, ahead. I know here here when the county commissioners meet they bring in somebody from outside because I have been asked to do the invocation yeah, i've there. done it once and um you know i'm just trying to remember right now is the meeting called to order after the invocation or before the invocation you, you know I when don't, we I when don't we, really recall when we try to parse that here's a here's a thought on that when we try to parse that aren't we saying all right god you can come in now <laughs> you know, right. it's like all right leave the room now so we can get on with our business okay, so ben, one way or the other we so I've, I've talked about that at church meetings before mm-hmm. you know we open the meeting with a prayer say mm-hmm. the trustees are meeting we open the meeting with a prayer mm-hmm. say lord bless our time together help us make good decisions etc cetera, etc cetera. and then we put god out in the hallway talk about church business and at the end we call him back in and yeah. have another <laughs> prayer to say lord we hope that you're happy with all the decisions yeah, we make a, a by now, the way, did you get a chance to look it over? Right. Now, am I saying that's the way that meetings are at, yeah. at the church I serve? I don't believe they are. But I think it's too easy to do that. And the whole invocation at a uh, at a council meeting or something like that, I can see where God is discussed here in the first 30 seconds, maybe 15 seconds, and then we just sort of put him away. Yeah. And go on and do our business. It's, in other words, as God an ornament. Right. His, Wouldn't uh, it be wonderful, right? Yeah. If as they go through the agenda, you know, they have a little on the agenda. They said a moment of prayer yes, after each right. agenda item. A moment of prayer, or, or mm-hmm. at the end of the item, and all the people said, <laughs> "Amen." That's right. I like that. Although you know, all right, we're not trying to make this a theocracy. Believe mm-hmm. me, right. we don't believe in that. We don't believe that that's the way this works, but it's that there is an acknowledgement and recognition Mm -hmm. that there are powers, as you said, Mm -hmm. and authorities beyond what government has, the government of man has, that there is an entity (laughs) that exists. Well, this is also, this also goes to what we say in our constitution or in our bill of rights that we have a free uh, op. There should be no uh, impediment to the free exercise of religion. Correct. Is that exercise of religion is, is our, is what we live all the time, every day, not just for an hour or not just at the beginning and the end of a meeting. Mm-hmm. Uh, or at so, a meal time. So even even uh, take your trustee example. I know I've had that I had that discussion because it was had with me, but I have had it with our trustees that even if you're choosing uh, the shape of the light switch, you should be thinking about how is this further the kingdom of God. This right, is not right. You know, so it should be ingrained in all of our decisions and that's and that's what we hope from our our government as well. Is that and that and that works if the people who are in office are believers, but if they're not, it doesn't matter to them. You know, like you said, we are not a theocracy. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you know, we we've talked about this in here before, if you open up the door for somebody to come in and express a Judeo Christian view, then you've also got to open up the door for somebody to come in and express another view. Say you have a Buddhist who is on the council, okay. 
how would you feel about a Buddhist coming in and offering the invocation? Well, my prayer when my, my eyes are closed would still be to Jesus. <laughs> well, sure. So it, sure. you know, it is the idea that 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 we we don't we don't as Americans we we don't prohibit anybody from practicing their faith. That, that's, that's the right. point of pluralism, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is mm-hmm. that we're a pluralistic society, but and there's therefore a small we, part of but, but okay. yeah. The problem is the the non Christian is offended mm-hmm. if there is any mention of Christ or God or, or what or the atheist or whatever, rather than saying, okay, this is a fellow citizen's worldview. They're expressing their worldview. I'm going to pluralistically <laughs> allow that to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's right. really the point, isn't it? Right. And, it? and it's a very small part of society that's pushing so hard to cut that off for everybody else, those yeah. who do have some type of a faith, some who do have some type of a belief in a higher power. Well, you know, when you do church visitation and you talk to some of the people you go in, and some are Christian, some aren't, you know, it's it, you just, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like a box of chocolate. You don't know mm-hmm. what you're going to get. And they say, you know, and once the Christians say, I'm so glad my doctor prays before he does the surgery and the non-Christian says, why is he praying? Doesn't he <laughs> right. have the skills and confidence? So, yeah, all these things come into this banner when we, uh, when we make these arguments. And we hope that you'll stay with us for more here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball along with Carl Zorowski, Reverend Carl Zorowski and Reverend Robert Cornegie as we talk about some of the issues of the day. And one of the big controversies that came out in, in Catholicism in the last uh, couple of weeks has been about uh, conservative theologians accuse Pope of spreading heresy. That's the headline in the New York Times. Several dozen tradition-minded Roman Catholic theologians, priests, and academics have formally accused Pope Francis of spreading heresy with his 2016 opening to divorced and civilly remarried Catholics. In a 25-letter page letter delivered to Francis last month and provided Saturday to the Associated Press, the 62 signatories issued a filial correction to the Pope, a measure that they said had not been employed since the 14th century. The letter accused Francis of propagating seven heretical positions concerning marriage, moral life, and sacraments with his 2016 document, The Joy of Love, and subsequent acts, words, and omissions. The initiative follows another formal act by four tradition-minded cardinals who wrote uh, Francis uh, last year asking him to clarify a series of questions or dubia uh, they had about his 2016 text. Francis hadn't responded to either initiative. The Vatican spokesman didn't immediately respond to an email seeking comment late Saturday. It's only been a week, so we'll see what happens. The the wheels of the Vatican tend to move rather slow. Uh, but this is, uh, for for us as Protestants, we, we look at with some curiosity sometimes over these practices within the uh, Catholic Church of, for example, um, n- uh, not allowing communion of a divorced person perhaps or uh, seeking an annulment. But in this case, um, Pope Francis was trying to. Uh, no, he didn't. He didn't open the doors for necessarily for divorce. As I, as I understood, he didn't open the doors for divorced uh, persons to be um, uh, back in good standing for communion, necessarily. But he didn't want to close the door on them to coming to being in church. Is that? Am, am I getting that right? That's that's the way that I understand it, Ben. Um, and I think we talked about this before, that what we were seeing here was um, maybe a little more grace being offered to these people instead of just black and white rules. This is the way that it has to be. Um, and um, as you mentioned, the three of us in this room this morning are all Protestant. So we don't completely understand you know, what goes on um, with the way the Catholic Church works in areas like this but i do know that the catholic church is um they're they're very good at 
standing their ground. This is what we believe. This is what we've always done. This is the way it's going to be. And there's not a lot of room for error there. And so now we've got this pope who comes in and he says, well, you know, maybe maybe we need to look at this a little bit differently. And as in any church, someone new at the at the top coming in and saying, I think it's time to make some changes, that scares people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, and and um, it, it, this 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 goes all the way back to Vatican II, mm-hmm. where there were a lot of liberal. That's in the sixties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, remember right. that, right? And they moved away from the Latin Mass, and they they were, you know just historically, you know, we saw some Pope sig- John the Twenty Third, I believe. Yeah, with some some serious uh, rearranging going on, and and a lot of the the folks the sixty two. That signed this um, this letter um, are from the from the group that dug in their heels basically and said, "Wait a minute, this is if the Catholic Church, you know, the big difference between somewhat difference between Protestantism and Catholicism is that we are are um, solo scriptura." which means um you know scripture only that it's it's the it's the word of god the catholic church also has traditions of the church that are considered you know that you you the church interprets the word for the lay and i may be messing that up yeah. but you know the, the the and so these are important things when you start tinkering with the traditions of the church to conservative Catholics, then you're kind of stepping over the line a bit. And so, and, and the sanctity of marriage is a huge issue has always been Mm -hmm. a huge sanctity of life, Mm -hmm. sanctity of marriage. This is sacred stuff they're, they're talking about. And so when it, you know, you see this liberalization, kind of the opening of the door, he opened the door to the possibility that that um, divorced people can actually can receive, receive the sacraments, yeah. and this is a big deal. Yeah, the, the, the what part of this letter is asking, and part of what uh, some other bishops have asked before was for clarification. From what I'm reading about the origins of this filial correction, it actually begins with lay people and then is signed on by others, uh, priests or bishops maybe signing on to it as well, and that uh, it was asking for some clarification. Are you opening the door for divorced people who have not abstained from sexual relations to to come uh, back into the communion or, in, or to receive communion again? And that, that understanding apparently is fuzzy, and they believe from his original um, uh, statements there in the joy of love. Yeah, and I think that's part of the issue. Some of these that signed it are are the theologians and the philosophers, Catholic theologians, Catholic philosophers of a conservative bent, who really didn't have the opportunity to speak out in this, speak into this. You know, this sort of he just sort of put this out in his in his encyclical, you know, and so the, that was the, I think they're trying to push back a little bit on that and have a dialogue. And so far he hasn't, he hasn't responded to either group that did it, the Cardinals that yeah. did it, nor the, um, the lay that are it, reacting. I was looking in a, um, in a online uh, post that that's a uh, crux, uh, taking the Catholic pulse. Uh, they were talking about back when this was uh, originally as, uh, as, uh, Amoris Laetitia, is that how mm-hmm. it said? Uh, anyway, that it, that it said that the pontiff sought to move the church forward on the question, the question of communion for some remarried divorcees in a discreet way because he wanted the chapters on love to be central. Uh, that This wasn't even the main part of what he was saying in this, uh, uh, in this message. So uh, yet... Yet, like many politicians, uh, also, uh, once they say something, even if it's a sideline to what they intended to say, it becomes the headline. Well, that's it? exactly right. Yeah. 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 And, if, and if somebody has a problem with a particular facet of this, and it wasn't the main point that he was trying to make, they're going to focus on that, and the rest of it just gets kind of 
pushed out of the way. Mm-hmm. Because, that becomes you know, the headline. Who, who, who would ever say that, that um, you know, teaching on love would be a bad thing? Mm-hmm. No, it wouldn't be. But because it's now focused so much on this question of marriage and divorce that the rest of it is just it's just forgotten. Well, as I understand it, in the if if you you know those if, if the marriage the original marriage was not annulled, and an, the annulment process is huge in this, mm-hmm. which basically says it really wasn't supposed to happen. I guess you know it just we're just not going to recognize that as being a part of it. Mm-hmm. Then what that does it takes away that that accusation of adultery. Right. That, exactly. That you have, you're actually having a relationship with somebody while still married in the eyes of the church, and so that's that's the big issue. You know? Well, there's that, and I think there's also a question of authority here, because with the um, with this thing that that the Pope talked about. I believe that some of the decisions regarding whether or not someone could take communion go down to the local church, down below the the, the Vatican. Okay, mm-hmm. and so maybe some people see that um, it's taking the power away from this central. You know, it's 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 threatening the centralized power right. of the church structure. Yeah, All right. Well, Papal authority. Yes, yeah, so yeah. as a uh, as a person who's uh, been uh, married and divorced and remarried, you know, it is a it is something that I often consider. Is that where is my role? If I'd been a Christian, would I, would I've done that uh, at the time? And if I'd been practicing, all those things do come into play. But it also comes into play of forgiveness and grace. Well, that's mm-hmm. exactly so that's, right. That's where we differ, and uh, that's why for Protestants, this mm-hmm. this you know we are, we don't have this same. Most Protestants don't have this same. Issue yeah. with remarriage and divorce and all of that. I mean, we of course, you know, we know that you know the intention, mm-hmm. God's intention in here, His perfect will is mm-hmm. that marriage is between one man, one woman for their lives until death do them part. I mean, that's the that's the intention. But we know also that that there is a grace that's mm-hmm. provided in that in, in certain circumstances. Yeah, so. And, and so that becomes uh, that becomes a difficult uh, uh, understanding for Protestants who may, in fact, feel some guilt, guilt and shame over over previous actions, but also uh, you know are looking at, for that grace. Where's that grace and forgiveness? Well, that was one of the things that struck another article that I read on this was talking about how they were accusing him of be, be, becoming a, a follower of Luther. Uh oh. <laughs> and and what a year to do that <laughs> <laughs> because luther was a priest who yes. married and you know all of that stuff and it was uh it was quite a quite a, a scandal mm-hmm. you know back in the day and so they're saying well you're just kind of following the protestant perspective on this thing rather than holding to our catholic traditions mm-hmm. yeah so it's it's not over yet yeah It'll be interesting to see how he responds. Because even as we differ in our expressions of theology from time to time in some areas, some important areas, you know, uh, we still look at, uh, at at the Catholic Pope, even Protestants look at the Catholic Pope and say, you know, he is he speaking? Is he speaking for the cross here? So, And so we, we're, we take some interest in all this subject. Yeah. Uh, we'll have more here on Faith Matters on the Talkstation in just a moment. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Robert Cornegie and Reverend Carl Zorowski. And uh, I hope we don't get too much in the weeds here on this one. We've got actually a couple of book reviews that are coming up in the next two segments. And, and uh, we, we're, we're going to strive to find, find the interest, the, the wider interest in this. This one, the first one, though, I, I think a lot of people have wondered what happened. What happened between the Old and New Testament? Why are they starkly different? And this is a... This is actually from a column called Flunking Sainthood, which is 
I think maybe my favorite column name this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jonna Reese or Rice uh, writes it, and she writes um, where Satan. The headline is where Satan came from and other key events between the two testaments. Any idea how much uh, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam owe to the huge social and religious changes that happened during two revolutionary centuries between 250 and 50 BC? Yeah, me neither. But I just read a fascinating book about it. Philip Jenkins rivals Karen Armstrong as a writer who can take on some of the most complex topics of religious history and make them accessible without dumbing them down. Uh, Adding to his line of smart, informative books is this uh, new one. It's called Crucible of Faith, the Ancient Revolution that Made Our Modern Religious World. I interviewed uh, the Baylor University historian about his new book, and his answers are edited for length and clarity, and we're going to edit them even further. Um, that this is a, you know, Robert, I think this is a fascinating topic. Uh, so more than just for pastors is that a lot of people, you know, get to the end of Micah and then comes Matthew and they say, well, wait a minute, (laughs) there seems to be a lot of time here that's gone by since then. What, what happened to that period? I mean, do you teach that in, uh, in apologetics? Do you, do you kind of look at that period and, and have a explanation for it? Yeah, yeah, there there are some that do. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, this really isn't an apologetic topic. This is more of a polemical mm-hmm. topic. This is sure. kind of inside baseball stuff. So um, apologetics tends to be towards the unbeliever kind mm-hmm. of thing. And so, you know, these things, these kind of things, people, there are not many people walking around wondering, hmm, I wonder what happened. Well, <laughs> during that period, well, the, the Christians do, or but, the the Jews, or but the apologetic part might be someone who says, "Well, that New Testament just completely contradicts the Old Testament." Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, you know, and I take a little bit of issue with the with the, one of the premise early premises in in this article that there is no link between the two that it, that that the the fallen nature of mankind was just discussed in Genesis in about the garden of Eden. And then right. it's not talked again about until Paul mm-hmm. shows up. Well, I mean, you know, that's just, I'm sorry. That's just not true. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, the, the scarlet thread of redemption, we call it mm-hmm. runs all the, the way through both Testaments. The ark of it's God's an, plan. It's right? an unbroken yeah. string. And for, for this, this, um, author, or uh, I'm assuming the author did it, but definitely the, uh, the author of the book versus mm-hmm. the author of the article right. about the book <laughs> right. kind of drew that conclusion that it was broken somehow in the process, and then it, it picked back up later on with, with Paul. And that's sort of that anti-Pauline stuff that's infiltrated the church as well. So, yeah, so but there are obviously books – collections of books you know the catholic bible we were just talking about catholicism has mm-hmm. a has books that it includes the from apocrypha that, yeah that mm-hmm. period that address you know that and, you know we again protestants don't really recognize them as part of the canon of the of the bible but well, um, they can be informative but they can be informative. informative yeah and and they're you know there's some interesting stuff in there but um yeah so I agree that there was that you know the kind of the popular myth is that there was silence for 400 years. Mm-hmm. Well, there wasn't obviously that God was doing stuff. We just you know it when it it picks up. It talks about you know the whole purpose of the Old Testament was to drive us towards a Messiah, a Savior mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that we could not save ourselves. Exactly. Yes. That we had to have a savior, a Messiah, the begotten, the only begotten son of God had to come. And so then it picks up, boom, with that in the New Testament. So, and it picks up way before Paul got involved mm-hmm. <laughs> in, in the gospels and, and other writings. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I'm a little critical of the approach, mm-hmm. but I'd like to read the book, frankly, um, just to see some of the the um, some of the backstory that he, mm-hmm. that he bases his his part on. Well, you know, uh, as you you study uh, theology, you study the the how the uh, Bible came to be, and we look at all these things. We we do get to a point 
where we see that the, this oral tradition of the Old Testament it was finally being written down after a long period of time, and, uh, and that these were studied, and these were the books that were accepted, or these were the letters and the books and the wisdom literature and all of the, uh, um, the Pentateuch and the, the Torah that were accepted, and then, uh, then these were not, but they are certainly of interest. Uh, right. And and he's kind of lumping them together in, in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Um, he wrote, in fact, I think we talked about it on this show a couple of years ago. Uh, his book called "The Many Faces of Christ," which looked at uh, so-called lost gospels, right? And and, and how they, they weren't really lost. I mean, they, they've been known for some time. They just really haven't been very all that popularized. Uh, right. So, um, how about in Bible study? Do you, does this come up? Do you see, Carl, that uh, that people, are, or is it of interest to try to say how do we get to the language? The names are so different. Everything, right. you know, why can't they call these people in the Old Testament like some of the names are used in the New Testament, for example? Um, I, I have seen this come up in Bible study. One mm-hmm. of the um, more interesting points is uh, when you look at the Book of Job, mm-hmm. where you have God and Satan having this conversation about Job at the beginning. And one of my professors at Duke, uh, Dr. Eford, um, he didn't even pronounce the name Satan when he talked about the book of Job. He called him Satan and that he was a member of the heavenly court Mm -hmm. and that he was also called the accuser. But the character of Satan in the book of, of Job can't necessarily be equated with our modern idea of Satan as the devil, because as Dr. Eford explained, that concept Mm -hmm. of this leader of the demons or the the face of evil in the world, that that really came about more during that intertestamental period between Mm -hmm. um, the closing of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament. So, you know, there's some things interesting there. And and then some of the books in the Apocrypha can be very useful in Bible study because as you read them, you get a nice picture of what life was like during those years. Like the Maccabees. Right, like the Maccabees. And it sheds more light on the stories that we read about, about Jesus. Is there a is there a um, a cause for concern you know from us as as pastors we kind of we go our merry way and we take some some things theological things for granted we take some things about an understanding of who Jesus is who God is and then uh, when we talk about the evil one uh, we mm-hmm. have a certain understanding there too and then when people question that and say well wait a minute is is the is Satan was well, Satan a god well here here's here's a good point to that Ben when we read the old testament books one of the things we need to do is read them in light of when they were written who they were written to and what they knew when they were written we see the story of the fall we have the serpent people today say oh yeah that was satan well they didn't have any concept of satan at that time but when they wrote the book they did have the concept of a serpent can we look at that and say well could that serpent have been satan sure it could have Mm -hmm. and i i tend to think that yes that was that was satan coming in and messing everything up but the original um receivers of that book did not have that knowledge that we have today yeah well you know there are again this is your hermeneutics this Mm -hmm. is how you particularly study the bible and Mm -hmm. so there are different methodologies and the lens we all have to agree the lens that you're looking that's exactly right Right. and and what we can say you know just kind of i mean these are interesting discussions Mm -hmm. but i think the authority for what we believe from scripture whether it's old or new testament rest in our savior correct correct i mean i don't think he was confused about these issues or who he was or or his right. you know he he was pretty clear about it you know he said i didn't come to reinterpret the the old covenant mm-hmm. right he said i came to fulfill it Right, and so now we can look at all of these old things and we can see Christ in there. 
Okay, or, or we can see that he is the fulfillment we of what was it, happening there. Because we look at it that lens. We're using right, that lens to see right. it. We're right, using, we're using that lens. Well, yeah. And but so then with looking his, at it from with a, his encounter with Satan in the wilderness, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is that, was that just a figment of his imagination that didn't really exist from the beginning of time? I mean, look, he would know. <laughs> right? <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the second person of the Godhead would know what the truth is. And so that's, and he, his references back to the Old Testament in his teachings are pretty clear. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think we have to, you know, look for um, allegories and, uh, you know, all kinds of, of you know, m- interpretations of what he was saying. He was pretty straightforward about it when he said it. And uh, as in the time of Noah, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you know, he keeps making these references that many of the critical scholars would say, oh, no, you know, well, they actually got that from another book. You know, this is the the um, documentary hypothesis concept, right, you know, right. and that it didn't, you know, Moses really didn't write this stuff. And uh, so, you know, so you have to really go back. And we're getting deep in the weeds here. Yeah, so you're going right. to have to pull us out. But, you know, this is a <laughs> – for the – for theologians, students of the Bible, this is fascinating stuff. Yes, it is. Probably for everybody listening this yeah. morning, they're going, give me another cup of coffee. Yeah. I have no idea what these people are talking about. Well, the, the book <laughs> is by Philip Jenkins. It's called Crucible of Faith, and we'll have a, a different kind of book and a very different angle to look at, too, coming up next. Welcome back to Faith Matters here on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, the Reverend Robert Cornegan, and Reverend Carl Zorowski. Carl, you've got a you've got an event coming up uh, as we are recording this. Uh, it would be played back on Sunday, so it's coming up today. Yes, yes, this afternoon, beginning at 2 o'clock at St. Peter's United Methodist Church, we are holding a neighborhood picnic. Uh, as I said, it's going to start at 2. We're going to put burgers and hot dogs on about 4. It's all free. We're going to have bounce houses. We're going to have face painting. It's just going to be a great time for people to come and see what we have to share at St. Peter's. So we hope that you'll be there. Say, so, And now the entire listening audience is the neighborhood, right? That's that is correct. <laughs> all all of you who are listening, please come out to St. Peter's right. in Moorhead. We are located behind the State Employees Credit Union on Hodges Street. There you go. All right, there you go. There's a little plug. Now we're going to get to our our final uh, story here. This one I, uh, again, we kind of do the um, sign of the apocalypse uh, uh, segment here at last. It's, it's, this isn't as outrageous actually as it is, but it is. It's kind of amusing because who knew. <laughs> you know, I am not a I'm not a student of Darwin, so I I did not know this. But almost all, um, if you look back at it, Robert, you know, almost all great thinkers, all the people that we've written about and and talked about, they all have other minor stuff, minor writings, or things that don't quite catch on quite like uh, their major works do. Uh, yeah, well, people will pick up certain aspects of of the writings and just concentrate on that particular aspect aspect because it meets their kind of worldview Mm -hmm. approach on it and that's exactly what we were talking about that with the pope you know Mm -hmm. and this is exactly what's happening here so that i'm comparing the pope to charles darwin but so (laughs) here is a book called the evolution of beauty and it is about a darwin theory and it's being written about in the new york times book review by david dobbs writes it uh and in this uh he talks about all the different books that are about darwin and some that they explore some of these, but this one is um, is is exploring a little known theory. I'm trying to figure out where to pick it up now. The author, his last name is uh, Prum Prum mm-hmm. P R U M, mm-hmm. uh, and again it's called the Evolution of uh, Beauty. It says Prum, drawing on decades of study, hundreds of papers, and a lively, literate, and mischievous mind, means to prove an enriched version of Darwin's sexual selection theory and rescue evolutionary biology from its tedious and limiting adaptationist insistence on ubiquitous power of natural selection. I love the sentence. Um, He feels insistence has given humankind an impoverished, even corrupted view of evolution. What what Darwin's theory here of beauty, of uh, beauty selection, uh, is that, is that in the, and you see it in the animal world, is that the prettiest win. You know, mm-hmm. they're the ones that survive. And in fact, this article is called The Survival of the Prettiest. Isn't this, isn't this fascinating? 
to take this it, twist. It is, and uh, I'm very greatly concerned about the survival of the three of us <laughs> in um, the room this morning. Well, yeah, we may not make it till the afternoon. <laughs> no, it, it, it is interesting because he, he talks about some of the, uh, the, the attractive plumage on some of the male birds, mm-hmm. um, some of the markings on other animals uh, where the males – would attract the females and that uh this whole survival of the fittest thing just did not fit into this equation and so it must be something else yeah we, we like to throw it always gets we back like to, to sex throw a little flamethrower at the evolution era, yeah, don't yeah. We, now well, and look look dawkins all that crowd they do they don't you know like the descent guy. of man who's ever heard of that book or that that paper that he wrote. I mean, mm-hmm. that's that you know, it's it's everybody may know the title, but I don't think anybody ever finished reading the thing <laughs> because it it really did for the good evolutionists. It threw a monkey wrench in the uh, in the whole process because it said that whoa, there's actually other factors rather than just the the fittest uh, uh, mechanism for evolution. Right. Well, it says Darwin mm-hmm. conceived of this idea largely because he had found natural selection could not account for the ornaments seen in many animals, especially males all over the world. The bright buttocks and faces of many monkeys and apes and the white legs and backside of the Bantang bull in Malaysia, the elaborate feathers and mating dances of countless birds, including uh, bee eaters and bell birds, uh, night jars, hummingbirds and herons, gaudy birds of paradise and lured pheasants. Uh, and the peacock, the showboat, uh, whose extravagant tail uh, seems a survival hindrance, but so pleases females that well-fanned coxies regularly win their favor. Only a consistent preference for such ornament in many species, a choice exerted by the female. Isn't that, that's just fascinating to me, is that, uh, is that the, the survival of the fittest is, is not, is not he, by Darwin's own admission, does not account for the whole explanation of evolution yeah well okay (laughs) um but it's an interesting theory and and obviously it was not picked up (laughs) by those that were were um using darwin's um origin of the species as a tool Mm -hmm. to move people away from this concept that there was design in actual intelligent design in creation there see now this is where i wanted to go to with uh, this article is that this just points out to me uh, is that god in the particular you know is that is that that layer of plan that layer of uh, of of uh you know, that the odds of happening in this fashion are just not not with it uh so uh, it is it is god in that in that minutia that's right and his planning right that's why it wasn't picked up and um, and so they they couldn't deal with it. Now they're looking for. They're still trying to figure out how to make this thing work, because they've already kind of abandoned, you know, original Darwinism theory. You mm-hmm. know, these these minuscule adaptations. You know, that were just happened. There mm-hmm. was no reason or rhyme behind them. They just happened. And uh, it took a huge amount of time for that to happen. Well, they've pretty much abandoned that in the you know in the halls of academia and uh, they've they've gone to m- other models like the hopeful monster or punctuated equilibrium or some of these other things where they say no evolution happened in just a boom it just happened and one day a lizard's laying little lizard eggs and the next day a feathers come out okay. on the little lizard <laughs> and this guy's saying no those feathers happened because it was a guy, and he was trying to uh, attract, gonna, the, attract the attention of the <laughs> of the girls, yeah. and uh, so you know it's it's it really is fascinating to watch as they they try to make these things all all fit into their little little worldview. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's funny. Uh, he's uh, the article here that's reviewing this book uh, also then eventually gets to the idea of, of uh, uh, selections among humans. Right, uh, and he says he nimbly mines both the animal and human literature to show how, for one human trait after another, adaptionist explanations miss the mark, while aesthetic explanations hit home. 
his catalog of things natural selection can't explain but sexual selection easily can and includes here homosexuality, a tendency toward monogamy, both sexes, taste for incapacity for sex outside of a female fertility, fertility periods, other kinds of stuff in here too, just a panoply of uh, things that are just uh, seem to be uh, contradictory and, and not related at all. But uh, but to me, if you go back, every time we, we kind of get the... Uh, evolutionary um those who are just follow this as a religion running in circles then we have an idea of saying maybe maybe we have another idea maybe there's another idea there right and i i I look at this and i say okay is this why all of the um the really good looking guys who were on the football team got all the good looking girls who were the cheerleaders in high school, you know, was that all evolution? And I was just the, uh, you know, the, the non-survival of the rest of no, us. That's, that's just jealousy talking. Oh, is that just jealousy? <laughs> okay, you know, I was, I was hanging out with, with my band buddies. You know. um, but yeah, it's, it's, this, this is fascinating. I worked for state parks for a while and I worked with some people who were very much uh, into ornithology. Okay. And they loved, to go out bird watching and they would show me all these different birds and different species and it was fascinating to see the variety and mm-hmm. just how beautiful the plumage was on some of these male birds there's more to it than just it worked out better that way for them to attract the females and as more of the females were attracted and more of the beautiful birds were there that they just continued to get more and more beautiful i think i think um the writer refers to it as a as a multi-generational conversation of evolution between the mating pairs yeah and you know i think it's there's a bit of a dishonesty in in the pr- presentation of this quite frankly i would say because really we're talking in when evolution you really do have to kind of parse it out between macro evolution and micro evolution mm-hmm. macro evolution believes and this is darwinian evolution that that you actually move from one species mm-hmm. to another species right it's right. not just. It's not like the dog thing where you. Oh, it's the old drawing that we've seen. And, right, and exactly. You become a completely evolution. different. Um, micro evolution is adaptation mm-hmm. to environmental issues or conditions, or apparently to the pretty girl who moved down the street. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that's exactly right. And so you know, we can. There's an allowance for that in that, but it's not. They're not changing species. Yes, that's right. They're just ornamenting. Yes, ornamenting. (laughs) Accessorizing. That's it. And with that, that's the last word for today. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at thetalkstation.com. Give me faith. Trust what you is a production of the talk station.